Good morning, everybody. After all these exciting topics about next generation, whatever, and so on, I want to talk about something which shouldn't be your problem at all. Because ransomware was not designed to be an enterprise problem. But unfortunately, it's working in an enterprise environment. And why? Because you likely didn't invest in security basics. When you go to conferences like here, like everywhere, you look at cloud security. You look at next generation endpoint. And you might hear this later on, I hate the term next gen, because based on this, I'm carrying a next gen iPhone every year. The term itself for me is just for a techie a bit absurd. But you're looking for it. You're looking for breach detection system to be protected against APT from state-sponsored actors. Doesn't this sound cool? And I bet you invested money in it. We are talking about endpoint detection and response. In the past, this was endpoint protection. Now, analysts like Gartner just figured out a new term for it to make it more sexy. We talk about security information and event management, theme system, arc sites, this kind of stuff. And you talk about identity and access management. And when you are at a conference, you are looking for a new silver bullet, and somebody tells you, throw away all your existing content security, buy my next silver bullet, and it's 100% protection. When you hear this, outside the show floor, run away. There is no 100%. But I think we all want something new, something working which helps. But we are forgetting about the security basics and actually the media also supports this need for new things. I don't know if you saw this movie already. It's a documentary about Stuxnet and other state-sponsored attacks. It's pretty cool. It's, you know, how US and Israel created this Stuxnet and it was spreading around the globe. It's a cool documentary, but it creates fear, uncertainty, doubt. So you want to buy new silver bullets. Then you see this, Pegasus, the iOS malware, three zero days infecting iOS phones all around the globe. Actually, it infected 10 users around the globe before it was made known, and Apple fixed it pretty quick. But this is what people want to hear. They want to hear about zero days. That's cool. They want to hear about APT. APT actually is a term coined by the US Air Force in 2005 to describe state-sponsored attack. And the likelihood that you are a of a victim of a state-sponsored attack, let's be honest, is lower than you being a victim of a competitor or an insider who steals your client's database, who steals intellectual property, but that's not an APT. That's a targeted attack. And you don't need to be very sophisticated, actually, to conduct this cybercrime. So it's really this stuff is fear, uncertainty, doubt. And I have to say, what we are seeing now is a lot of companies invested in protection against this, but not in the basics anymore, unfortunately. Of course, vulnerabilities are important. Vulnerabilities are severe. I wouldn't underestimate that you need to do proper patch management, that you need to do proper things to shield yourself against vulnerabilities. Uh, part of Trend Micro is the Zero Day Initiative. And how do you read this? This is what we reported to different vendors from 2010 to 2016. So for example, for Microsoft, we reported to Microsoft 457 vulnerabilities, and Microsoft needed an average 116 days to release a patch. So the attacker, best case for the attacker, has 116 days before Microsoft released a patch. Then you have to add maybe 19 days within your organization till you have rolled out the patch to all your system. So the attacker has a window of opportunity for 200 days. But again, it's not a zero day. It's not very sophisticated. Somebody knows about this stuff already. And you could buy this stuff pretty cheap in the underground. And we always do threat 
predictions. And last year, in October, we predicted that 2016 will be the year of online extortion. And it was relatively easy to predict because we looked at all the data breaches. We looked at all the ransomware waves starting. And indeed, it is the year of online extortion of data breaches you just read about Yahoo. And you know, you might have read that it was likely a state sponsor. I would bet, and we could talk in a break about it, why that it was not a state-sponsored attack. But it's easy to blame a state when you lose 500 million of your customer records. Because what could you do against the state? Ransomware is hot, and it's hot in the news everywhere. And the news don't talk anymore about individual home users. They talk about organizations being affected. They talk about hospitals who lose all the patient records because they are encrypted, and they need to transfer the patient over to another hospital. And that's really scary. But the big question for me is, where are the security basics preventing these kind of attacks? When you see this, that's even worse. In UK, more than half of the UK companies have been hit by ransomware based on a, on a recent statistic. And you know what the risk uh, management plan in UK is for companies? We buy bitcoins in advance to pay the ransom if we need to. Think about it, you pay ransom to cyber criminals to fund their business. You don't get an invoice from the ransomware authors. So how will you explain it to your accounting department? Will you make a screenshot of the ransomware and say that's the invoice? Good luck with accountant. I don't know how they do it. But yeah, that's scary. I hope it's not the same here in Hungary. And it's actually, for me, it's a momentum. That's why I hate the term next gen. It's an evolution of cybercrime. Up to 2004, it was non-commercial. Then it really turned commercial. We talked about APT. We talked about targeted attacks since 2010. Then we talked a bit about mobile attacks. We don't see many mobile attacks. The bad guys didn't make money with it. At the moment, we see a lot of destructive attacks and crypto ransomware, and it became an enterprise problem. It became so big that, for example, the FBI in June this year did a public service announcement, companies better be careful of ransomware. So it really became a global problem. And if we look at the Trend Micro internal statistics, uh, we saw 79 complete new families. I'm not talking about variants in first half of 2016. It's a 172% increase comparing with last year, which means that it's working for the bad guys, for the bad actors, and they're making a lot of money with it. This is why they are funding new malware, new ransomware families. This is the increase we saw first half. And actually, it wasn't an enterprise problem all the time. The first generations of ransomware have been a pure consumer problem. I'm talking about fake EV, and I'm talking about traditional ransomware. Just to explain it, this was fake EV. You go to a web page, a window pops up and tells you security scan is happening, and then it tells you that you have problems on your computer. Click here to do a proper scan. You click on it, you start a simulation, which after it ends tells you that you detected that you have 200 security problems on your computer. Do you want to fix it? And of course you want to fix it. Then you click again and then it tells you just for $49, euros, whatever. It fixes all your malware problems by downloading an antivirus which is certified by the FBI, NSA, Trend Micro, Kaspersky, whomever. And end users clicked on it 
and paid money to download more malware, which again contained a antivirus simulator. Pure consumer problem. We didn't see many of these instances in the enterprise space, and if we saw one, it was one desktop worker paying 49 bucks with his credit card. Who cares? Nobody cares. Consumer problem. Then we saw ransomware, traditional ransomware. This is lock screen ransomware, and they had it in all languages. And what it did is malicious binary, uh, actually changing the boot up sequence of your computer. So next time you start your computer, you see this first, your system is locked and illegal activity has been detected. Police has locked your computer. Go to a gas station, buy you cash, buy iTunes gift cards and whatever, and send it over to pay the penalty. And it always used a police force logo, so police wasn't very happy about it. And again, it was everywhere. I also have Hungarian examples if you want to see it on my computer. And as a matter of fact, it was a consumer problem. Because in an enterprise environment, this stuff only changes the boot up sequence. So when you have a system administrator who knows how to boot your computer from an external media, not a problem at all. What we have now is sophisticated. What we have now is scary, and what we have now initially was also designed for consumers. But it's crypto ransomware. And the first crypto ransomware early last year, it only encrypted the local hard drive. Not an enterprise problem. If you're not the corporate lawyer who just spent three months on working on a merger and acquisition deal, and this document is encrypted. Bad luck. It became an enterprise problem when the bad guys figured out, hey, people have backups. People have network shares. And they store the documents there or on Dropbox. So the crypto ransomware started to encrypt everything it could get on your network shares, on your Dropbox, and it nuked your online backup. And out of the sudden, it became an enterprise problem because it was not just your local computer anymore. It was every computer the local system was able to reach. A pretty scary variant is Jigsaw. And that's what you see nowadays with ransomware. Jigsaw encrypts your files. And then a counter starts. And after one hour, it deletes file number one. After two hours, it deletes 10 files. After three hours, 100 files, and so on and on and on, which somehow is a trigger that you pay faster. What Jigsaw also does, if you try to reboot your system, you are about to make a very bad decision, and it informs you every reboot it deletes 1,000 files. So you shouldn't do attempts to remove this kind of malware. This is what we are seeing nowadays, and this stuff encrypts every network share, every document on every network share. So when you see this picture, it's already too late, your files has been encrypted. And it's not a very complex encryption algorithm. It's not RSA, because RSA is asymmetric, so it takes time to encrypt. It's actually... Uh, AS-256, and then they protect the key with RSA because the symmetric encryption algorithm just works faster. They want to encrypt your files as fast as possible, but still, trying to get this stuff back is impossible if you don't have the key. We now even see malware which claims, and some of them do it, that they store a copy of your most important files in the cloud. They actually look at your history, the last files you have accessed, and they send it up to the cloud. And I had the debate with some lawyers about, under the upcoming GDPR in 2018, do you report ransomware, even if it doesn't do this, and extract your data and send it to a cloud server? And you know what the reply from the lawyer was? A third party, has accessed your data, 
it was not under your control and it manipulated your data. Under GDPR, you have to report to the authorities. So GDPR will be an additional incentive for the bad guys because it will be even more painful for you. But ransomware, crypto ransomware, is nothing new. We saw the first crypto ransomware in 1989, but it wasn't sent by email. Email didn't exist. Who of you is as old as me and remember this stuff? This is how the first crypto ransomware was sent out. 25,000 copies of a floppy disk. And you know what? It worked as well. The only thing that didn't work was the money transfer, because at this time no Bitcoin, so the money tra was traceable, and this is how they caught this guy. But again, it's nothing new. It has to do with basics, malware basics, and also your security basics. Why do the bad guys do it? Pretty simple. It's return of investment, return per infection, what we heard before. When you infect a computer with a spam bot, you get five cents per 50,000 spam cent. Not very attractive, because there's an oversupply of spam bots. Banking Trojans worked very well for a while, until everybody went to multi-factor authentication in online banking, until the bank really checked up the anti fraud mechanisms. So grabbing online banking data, grabbing credit card information isn't as lucrative anymore as it has been in the past. What really brings big money at the moment is crypto ransomware, and we see complete ecosystems around this, like ransomware as a service, like attack toolkits, all this kind of stuff, to enable everybody to start a new cybercrime venture and make money with crypto ransomware. So it will not go away soon, unfortunately. Protection against ransomware. What do you do? At first, if you do the security basics right, it shouldn't be a problem, because if you do the security basics right, you of course have proper backups. And ransomware shouldn't be a problem at all, because the best way against crypto ransomware is backup. You might lose one hour or two hours, but you don't lose your data. So ask yourself, do you have traditional three copies of backups in two different formats, and one is always offline? And that's the problem. We believe in the cloud. We believe in online. We believe in dynamics. So everything is online. Everything is always reachable, including your backup media. And that's what the ransomware guys know, and this is why they nuke your backup media first, when it's online. So go back to the backup basics. Number two, as I mentioned before, keep current with patching. A lot of companies don't patch fast enough. And some ransomware uses an exploit kit to launch the initial infection. So you visit a web page and you will be infected. But it's not the main entry vendor vector. Let's make it very clear. Uh, there have been a famous exploit kit being used, Angler exploit kit, but the Russian authorities shut it down because the guys have been too aggressive in Mother Russia. So the Russian authorities uh, jailed the group who was behind it. Uh, you should look at a successor neutrino exploit kit, but it's not as prominent. Less than 30% of all ransomware infections are via exploit kits. But this doesn't mean that you should forget about patching. That's baseline security. Education, education, education. If your employee receives something from an unknown source, and he just clicks on it to see what this is about. If he opens every binary, every attachment, and clicks, dung, 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 despite all the Windows 8, Windows 10 security warnings, you have a problem with your employees. Your employees should be the best defenders. So, 
ask your IT department to do pen testing on every employee. Once every half year, send out a funny message with a link to click on. And then just measure how many people clicked on it. And then don't blame individual users, but publish the results to the complete company. Say, 20% of our employees clicked on this stupid message. Maybe you shouldn't say stupid, you should be more polite, but this helps because employees are more careful before they click on something. If you have the money, hire an external pen testing company to make it more realistic. Access control. Does every user really need to have access to every asset on the computer? Are we still in a time where we are running personal computers based on a DOS dirty operating system where every user could install whatever he wants on a POS system, on a critical server? You should know on critical systems what processes are running. You should validate every addition to the server system because we are talking about critical systems. And you could use ransomware and the hype around ransomware to your advantage, because your board has read about ransomware. And everybody knows somebody who had an infection. That's the beauty of ransomware. Unlike targeted attacks, state-sponsored attacks, it's highly visible. They want to know that you are infected. So this momentum could help you to do more drastic steps to bring back control over your network, which was done with PCs, bring your own device or bring your own disaster, all of this. You could be more strict nowadays, for sure. Don't pay the ransom. Some people tell you if you pay the ransom, there's no guarantee that you get your data back. You know what? Most of the time you get your data back because the crypto ransomware, before it encrypts, it does a key exchange with the CNC server, and only if this communication works, it starts encrypting. Because they want that you get your data back. If you pay, if you don't get your data back, you tweet about it, hey, I paid the ransom, but I didn't get my data back. That's bad for the attacker. That's bad for the reputation. They want that you get your data back. But when you pay, you will be on a hit list and they share this. If you want to see every ransomware family on earth, pay the ransom as an enterprise. You will be attacked all the time. That's what I could guarantee you. And improve your general security posture. It's really best practice by using your existing solutions, not buying new next-gen stuff for it. You likely have an email gateway product. Maybe you've outsourced it, so you lost some flexibility. You could do a hell with email gateway because most of the ransomware comes in as an email with an attachment or with a link a URL. Web gateway, if the ransomware can't reach the CNC server, then it likely will not encrypt. If the first component, the first WinWord Marco, can't download malware components, it stops the infection. Web gateway, reputation, web reputation, very successful. You likely have this. You could do a hell on the endpoint. Some people say the endpoint is dead. It's not dead. It's evolving. It is not as efficient as in the past. But with a mix of different technologies, you could do a lot. Network. We now see more and more ransomware doing lateral movement, trying to get key assets and encrypt key assets. Work there. And servers. Vulnerability shielding, uh, knowing what processes are running there. When you have your databases on a key server encrypted, you're really in trouble. Most of the stuff, as I mentioned, comes in via spam. So really tune your email gateways. So the employees will not even see the email anymore. So they will not call the help desk. You reduce the problem dramatically. And let's be very honest, when you look at the binary matching, what traditional security vendors offer, 
Yeah, 57% uh, of the stuff you see in ransomware is not caught with traditional pattern matching. So this is why pattern matching is not as efficient anymore. But all the other methods, like IP checking, email checking, yeah, shielding your system is extremely effective. This is, when I look at our stats, we block 95% of all ransomware attacks at the email layer. So 95% less problems. And look at all the advanced technology at the next gen technology at the endpoint and so on. It blocks 0.0004% because all the stuff is filtered beforehand if you have a proper layered protection, if you have a connected sweat defense. And you likely have this already. You just need to tune it properly. I just give you some examples from within Trend Micro. My uh, inbox and the stuff which didn't make it into my inbox, I'm as the CTO of Trend Micro have access to it. Here, it just triggered a rule set, no JavaScripts. We also have a rule set, no macros in office documents from external sources. We have a rule set, no uh, executables from external and this kind of stuff. And this is basic for your email filters. I believe that you could be a little bit more stricter on these kind of things. Here's another example, and yeah, even the text is pretty stupid, isn't it? I wouldn't click on it, but I'm paranoid, but your employees might. Like this one, your parcel has been delivered. Please find the confirmation below. People shouldn't click on this, correct? But they do. So it's best that they never see it because your email gateway does the work. With basic filter rules. This is another one. And yeah, I'm German, so this is pretty good, I have to say. I'm an Amazon customer. I still wouldn't have clicked on it, but normal users within our organizations would. This one, this was a web filter element, killing it, because it's not Dropbox. There's an underscore between the R and the O. This was sandboxing because we have a sandbox element on our email gateways. And this went through initially. And this was pretty well made. But before employees within our organization could click on it, our sandboxing technology already told the URL filters to block this. So before anybody could click on it to download the malware, it was already blocked automatically. But this went through the email filter. Don't forget, Again, no matter what you do, no matter how you tune your email filter, the most important thing is really backup and restore. So this was ransomware. What will happen after ransomware? Business email compromise. And the good news is, your email gateway helps as well as against ransomware, if you do it right. What is BEC? It's a global scam, and it convinces your finance department to transfer money because it's a call from your CEO, an electronic call via email, to transfer money. And unfortunately, people fall for it, so the FBI also did a service announcement. Here are the losses till 2015. 2016, it's even higher, so it's profitable for the bad guys. Now we are talking about, uh, yeah, three billion global estimated losses on business email compromise. It happened recently in Austria, close to here, where a CEO and a CFO have been fired because they transferred 52 million euro to an attacker. It was an aircraft part delivery and it was just via an email. The instructions came via an email the bad guys analyze the communication and send it over. These are the top countries. You don't see Hungary on the list, but if you work with international suppliers, if you do a lot of communication in English, it could affect you, like it affected this Austrian company. This is how it looks typically, email from a high-level guy to finance department, urgent, transfer the money. Again, user education, user education, user education. It's getting more sophisticated. They figure out the targets via social media. 
say installed keyloggers to learn about how you communicate within the enterprise to send an email, which sounds too, but it's a spoofed sender. Again, with a proper email gateway protection, you could filter it out. They collect the CXO business trip information and then they start it. So be careful about this one as well. Interpol has jailed some guys already, but this doesn't mean that they stop their business. If a guy in Nigeria with five people could make 60 million, it's a huge incentive for the cyber criminals. So be careful about this. This will be the next wave after ransomware. Thank you.